going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Thief and Marathon. Download Veeley now. In the autumn of 1984 in Paris, France, two men embarked on a brutal crime spree. In just six weeks, they attacked nine elderly women in their homes, intent on taking their money and their lives. It was a spree, without any doubt, and a spree of the most murderous kind. 21-year-old Thierry Paulin and his partner Jean-Thierry Maturin tortured their victims, even killing one of the women by making her drink drain cleaner. I must admit that when I studied the case files, the photos and pictures were awful. It was difficult, very difficult. But after the couple split, it was Paulin who went on to become even more prolific, eventually confessing to killing 21 women when he was arrested in December 1987. He really was the worst criminal I have ever seen in the course of my long career. The worst. Thierry Paulin had undeniably become one of the world's most evil killers. It was a series of senseless killings that left the whole of France stunned. When 24-year-old Thierry Paulin was apprehended on the 1st of December 1987, he admitted to the murder of at least 21 helpless elderly women. In a series of killing sprees across three years, Paulin, a thief, left behind no witnesses at his crime scenes as he brutally strangled his victims to death. Detectives Jean-Claude Moulet and Claude Peroni had the task of bringing Paulin to justice. We were under immense pressure. The only thing we were afraid of was being on call. In other words, would a phone call wake us up that night? Headquarters calling us about a case, telling us about the killing of an old lady. We dreaded finding more victims every time. Paulin n'est pas un tueur en série. C'est un tueur en chaîne. Le tueur en série est un tueur pathologique. Paulin was not a serial killer. He was a spree killer. A serial killer is a pathological killer who kills to experience a physical or moral pleasure. In other words, he enjoys a terror he inspires in others. The spree killer is different. Paulin was a born criminal. In inverted commas, he was complete riffraff. Attacking a grandmother is a triumph without peril, which brings no glory. Attacking a grandmother, to vaincre sans peril, on triomphe sans gloire. In a twist of fate, Paulin himself would be dead before the trial of his accomplice, Jean Thierry Maturin, in December 1991. Philippe Bilger was prosecuting. Paulin escaped the trial. Unfortunately, it was AIDS that killed him. And of course, we can lament the fact that the mastermind, the instigator, was never brought to justice. This much is clear. Forgive me for being crude, but the criminal justice system took what was left. In other words, Maturin. Maturin was on trial for the murder of eight women in just over one month during the autumn of 1984. The details of the slayings were shocking, even to Maturin's defense lawyer, Michel Arnaud. The photos and pictures were awful. It was difficult, very difficult. I must admit that when I studied the case files, I made sure that I didn't, I didn't have lunch. I didn't have dinner. I couldn't, I couldn't. The killings always followed the same horrific ritual. Thierry Paulin, les, les poussait dans l'appartement en leur tenant la bouche. Thierry Paulin pushed them into the flat, holding their mouths. Jean-Thierry Maturin closed the door, 
And from that moment on, Thierry Paulin hit them to get them to tell them where the money was. Jean-Thierry Mathurin went to look for electrical cables to tie them up, so Thierry Paulin could tie them up. He went to search the flat. If the victim revealed where the money was, Jean-Thierry Mathurin went to check if it was there. And in the meantime, Thierry Paulin became incensed and ended up strangling them. This killer's story begins over 50 years ago. Thierry Paulin was born in the former French colony of Martinique in the Caribbean on the 28th of November 1963. His teenage parents split up within days of his birth. His uh, father abandoned he and his mother pretty shortly after his birth and went to France. Thierry remained in Martinique and was effectively brought up by his paternal grandmother, who uh, owned a restaurant and apparently neglected him. He made an attempt to go back to live with his mother, who by this point had remarried and had another family, but he didn't fit in incredibly well with that. In fact, he was a troubled young man. This is a young lad who's being passed from pillar to post. He doesn't have a lot of stability, he doesn't have a lot of routine, and life is quite chaotic. He's somebody who finds that, that he never settles in anywhere, and he never really has a, a sense of belonging. After moving to France, Paulin joined the army, but he was reportedly picked on for being of mixed race and a homosexual. In 1984, the 21-year-old moved to Paris. When he left the army, he went to live with his mother and he, he got a job at a, an entertainment venue that had a reputation for transvestite performers. And he, he joined in with this. I think this was uh, the first time in his life when he really felt a, a sense of belonging. And Thierry was homosexual and he developed a, a relationship with, with a man he met uh, at this place. Paulin's new lover was 19-year-old Jean-Thierry Maturin. The like-minded couple had aspirations of performing on the stage, and they also shared a passion for dressing in drag. I think if we look at his relationship, being homosexual in France at, at this time still carried quite a, a, a significant degree of, of social stigma. So even though he's found his, his place in the world, other people are still judging him, and I think that's something that is always going to trouble him. The couple began living together in a hotel called the Laval. The flamboyant pair had become addicted to drugs and weren't living within their means. It was the world of nightlife. They were invited to all the big Parisian parties. They were transvestites, people who loved to dress up. So they put on a real show. I think they really loved each other. I think there was real love there. But as part of that, Paulin dominated his partner which explains a lot the influence in Maturin was under. He existed through Paulin. Obviously, I didn't see them in their everyday lives. I didn't see them living together. I didn't see them laughing. I didn't see them in their most intimate moments. But I think it's clear that Paulin dominated Maturin and gave him the drugs he needed. As so often in life, and that's also true for criminals, there was a strong one and a weak one in this couple. And the weak one was dragged into a life of crime by Paulin during these atrocities in 1984. That much is clear. To pay for their lavish lifestyle, Paulin, with Maturin in tow, turned to crime. Each case, the motive was straightforward, money. Maturin and Pauline wanted to have a good time. They wanted to go out, they wanted to party, they wanted to go to nightclubs, they wanted to indulge their appetite for drugs, they wanted to wear different clothes, they wanted to be acknowledged as homosexual, and they were intent on having as good a time as possible. It was a spree, without any doubt, 
and a spree of the most murderous kind. We had two criminals under the influence of drugs who were completely remorseless and were looking for money, who laid waste to the scenes of their crimes, carrying out the worst kind of atrocities on these unfortunate old ladies. The old women were coming back from either the post office or the market. They came back with food and bread, etc., and which was found scattered on the floor in the doorway. It was child's play to push open the door and enter behind them, and then to subject them to mental and physical torture. The attacks were shocking in their brutality. The killers ripped off their victims' clothes, burnt their feet, and even smashed a wine bottle over one lady's head. Another was suffocated with a mattress, and in the most extreme case, 84-year-old Alice Benaim was forced to drink cleaning fluid. Something like drain cleaner, the main effect it has on the human body is that it is corrosive. So it will cause chemical burns to the mouth, tongue, the lips, and then if it's swallowed, it will cause chemical burns in the esophagus and the stomach, can potentially cause perforations. And if the fumes get into the lungs, they can set up a chemical reaction there, causing fluid on the lung and all sorts of potentially lethal consequences. One victim was Alice Benaim. To tell them where her money was, Paula and Mathurin forced her to drink a product used for unblocking sinks. You can only imagine the suffering to make her reveal where she had hidden her savings. One of them used to hide her savings inside her corset. She had pockets full of money. The way they made them talk was by twisting their fingers. It was to make them suffer. During this two-month spree, the horrific murders sent shockwaves across the country especially in the Montmartre district of Paris, where the majority of the crimes had taken place. I believe that what really struck public opinion was that the killer was targeting old, vulnerable, defenseless people. I believe that's what had the biggest impact on the public. There was no comparison between one murder and the next. It was the fact that these were defenseless people who were being killed. People were stunned, asking, why don't they arrest them? The public wanted justice, but detectives were struggling to find any suspects. And the longer it went on, the fewer facts we had, because everything had been tried to find them. All of the investigations had been done, from our perspective, but the luck factor was missing. You have to see that with the atrocity and repetitiveness of the crimes, as well as the fact that there were no central police files at the time, that there was a general feeling that they wouldn't be arrested. And that created a real panic amongst the public. Well, there was some speculation in the press that at the time that these offences were happening, that the neighbourhood of Montmartre had developed this mass hysteria, this, this mass psychosis. And psychologists find that, that this does tend to happen when you have an area where there's a phenomenon like a, a series of unsolved violent crimes. It makes people fearful, it makes them change their behaviour, it makes them often act in rather irrational ways because their sense of stability and, and their sense of, of belonging in their community has been completely upset by what's gone on. Even more pressure was put on the department specifically responsible for questioning and arresting criminals. The sense of fear among the population persisted, compounded by the professional disarray in still having failed to question them and not having been able to do anything to ease the concerns of the public. No one had seen the perpetrator or the perpetrators, a stranger in the block behaving abnormally or suspiciously. We had nothing. 
Matching fingerprints were found at several of the murder scenes, but with no central database, these were no help to the police. We had no database. That was created afterwards. It's always easy in hindsight to criticize the errors made by the police. But with the daily atrocities, they were in charge of finding a solution. It was very difficult. At the time, we didn't have the same resources as today. It's a shame we weren't more efficient at the time. We didn't have a forensic database because Paulin was already known to the police. Paulin had first come to the attention of French police after being convicted of a robbery in Toulouse in June 1983, when he was just 19 years old. He holds up a grocery store, an old woman who's running a grocery store, uh, with a knife. Not the brightest thing to do, given the fact that she knew who he was and that uh, she lived to tell the tale. And he was indeed arrested and indeed sentenced to two years in jail for the attack. For some reason, and it's not entirely clear to me exactly what that was, perhaps it was to do with his age, perhaps to do with the old woman saying, oh, be lenient. His two-year sentence was suspended. His empreintes digitales ont été relevées. His fingerprints had already been taken, but there was no central database and they remained in a paper file in Toulouse. So there they were, forgotten, as if they didn't even exist. Anyway, they never served for anything, because if we had been able to compare the prints to those in Toulouse after the first murder, we would have known that the prints belonged to Thierry Paulin, and the other murders would never have happened. By November 1984, Paulin and his accomplice Jean-Thierry Maturin had killed eight women in Paris in just over a month. But then, almost as suddenly as they had begun, the killing stopped. No one could explain why. So we had to ask ourselves some questions. We could assume that the perpetrators had left the Paris area, or even that they might have been imprisoned, hospitalized, or may even have died. We did some research. Statements were sent to various prisons explaining the modus operandi. We sent the fingerprints we have found at the crime scenes to find out whether identical prints had been taken at the prisons. But the results turned out to be useless. We got nothing but negative feedback. In fact, Paulin and Maturin had moved away from Paris and gone to live in Toulouse with Paulin's father. But while they were there, the couple's relationship became fractious. That did not turn out to be a success. Pauline and his father argued. Pauline's father fell out with Maturin, who he didn't care for. Pauline and Maturin fell out, and indeed, the relationship collapsed. Maturin returned to Paris. Pauline decided to stay with his father for a time, but that didn't last either. Paulin was alone in life, so was Maturin, but Maturin would never return to crime while Paulin continued. In late 1985, 22-year-old Paulin moved back to Paris and the murders returned with him. Between December of that year and June 1986, another eight elderly women were killed, and yet again, money was the motive. I don't think we can say that he was a serial killer, because a serial killer is a sadistic individual who takes pleasure in killing, who kills for the sake of it, for the pleasure of killing. That wasn't Paulin. He kills for money. There was a police officer from the La Brigade Criminal who said, he killed like he was going to the bank. I don't think he even realized the horror of what he had done. He attacked old ladies, he killed them, but in fact he acted as if he was going to get money from the ATM but he killed them so they couldn't tell anyone. Paulin had developed a familiar MO. At the time, I was a specialist in criminal autopsies, and I was present at the autopsies of some of the grandmothers killed by Paulin. All the grannies were mainly strangled. None of the attacks were what you would call sexual. None of them. 
They mostly involve stopping the victim breathing, so killing them through mechanical asphyxia. Strangulation is primarily something that causes damage to the blood supply to the brain. Suffocation limits the air supply into the lungs, so eventually will cause problems through lack of oxygen. Strangulation is much more effective than suffocation. Paul Lau was living in a hotel and loved to entertain the movers and shakers of Parisian society to boost his own social standing. He knew he was limited socially. He had aspirations to be something else, to be recognized, well-known and appreciated. He sought another kind of existence. He wanted to exist otherwise. He has an extremely human side. He had an extremely human side to him. There were people around him, especially ex-lovers, who knew him as a very sensitive person, who could be immensely kind, considerate, extra careful and attentive to others, to those he loved. So how could such an individual, and it is this that is so Machiavellian, how could this type of character transform himself into a killer who commits the act in half a second? Unbeknownst to the people around him, Paul Lam was like a real-life Jekyll and Hyde character. But this double life was about to be exposed. In August 1986, he was arrested on the outskirts of Paris when a drug deal went wrong. He wasn't happy with the quality of the cocaine he had bought, which led to a fight with his dealer. He assaulted the dealer, who called the police. The police stepped in and Paula was imprisoned, and so his fingerprints were taken again, but were not compared with those of the murderer of the old ladies. They didn't know it, but the police had missed an incredible opportunity to solve one of the biggest cases in French criminal history. Even so, Paula spent the next 16 months in prison. While he's there, and remember this is the middle of the 1980s, he begins to demonstrate the symptoms of HIV. By the time he is released from prison, he is fully aware that he is HIV positive, which at that point then was effectively a death sentence. Well, after he was diagnosed with AIDS, his offending really did escalate. And it wasn't just that, that he continued to kill people, but he, he engaged in almost kind of celebratory, spree-like behaviour afterwards. So he would spend a lot of money. He would party for, for days on end. And I think that that realisation that his life was, was limited, um, he was aiming to, to enjoy it as much as he possibly could. And if that meant the trauma and the suffering of other people, then so be it. But finally, on the 25th of November 1987, the callous killer made a mistake. During one of his final attacks, he was scared off by the concierge of the building. The woman he assaulted screamed, and the concierge came running in, after which a resident of the building saw Paulin escaping. The survivor was 87-year-old Berta Fenalteri. She'd been strangled and left for dead. Detectives hoped she may be able to provide a description of her assailant. Meanwhile, Paulin continued unabashed, and just two days later, he murdered another woman, bringing the suspected total of victims to 21. He threw himself a lavish 24th birthday party just days later. He invited around 30 friends with the money he had stolen from his last victim, and everyone said that Thierry Paulin was the perfect friend to party with, that he was a fantastic party mate. But no one knew where the money had come from. As Paulin parted away, Berta Finalteri had recovered and gave detectives a description of her unique-looking assailant. He is a big guy. 1 meter 82, athletic, 75 kilos, mixed race, with an earring, a haircut like Carl Lewis, blonde hair, 
A photo of it was created by the forensic department, the very same sketch that would be displayed in police and gendarmerie departments everywhere. Tous les services de police et de gendarmerie. On December the 1st, 1987, four days after claiming his final victim, Thierry Paulin was apprehended on the streets of Paris. A police officer who'd seen the photo fit sketch recognized him and asked him to come to the central police station for an ID check. I remember seeing him coming up the stairs under police escort. And of course, most of La Brigade Criminelle were waiting for him to arrive to see who this guy was, what kind of person he was, etc. Everyone had worked hard on this case, so everybody was very interested in seeing him. Detectives interviewing Paulin had a plan to get him to confess. They had a bottle of the same cleaning fluid he used to kill Alice Benaim in 1984 hidden away. This story about the caustic soda is very important. When Thierry Paulin was arrested, he was taken to La Brigade Criminelle and put in front of a policeman who would be listening to what he had to say. And this policeman had placed a bottle of caustic soda under his desk. Paulin was opposite him talking about the murder of Alice Benaim. The officer said, and Alice Benaim? To which Paulin replied, yeah, I don't remember. There were two of you, Paulin. Really, I don't remember. Really. Listen, it would be good if you do remember. There were two of you. Paulin was finding it difficult to come up with anything to confess. And then the policeman stuck his hand in the desk, pulled out the bottle of chemicals and said, and this, what is this? Paulin replied, it's not mine, that's Maturin. And just like that, he provided the name of his accomplice. Although he admitted to killing 21 people, the police charged Paulin with 18 murders. He soon began to tell detectives everything they wanted to know. Je le savais malade du sida. Donc déjà conscient de d'une chronique de mort annoncée. I knew he was ill with AIDS, so already conscious of a chronicle of a death foretold. He knew that he was going to die. He had nothing left to lose, perhaps an urgent need to open up to free himself. I would say even more to confess to the harm he had done, which meant that when he spoke to me, he told me everything. He got it all off his chest, demonstrating his extraordinary memory, his memory of the times, the locations and the details of the crimes he had committed. He relived everything he had done in front of me. That impressed me. It didn't take long for him to provide details of virtually every murder he had committed. He even told them the colours of the curtains, for example. Details about the crime scenes that only he could have known, that no one else but the victims could have known. He was a cold, determined man, the kind you don't encounter very often as a police officer. Given the number of victims and the manner in which these people were killed, he didn't particularly show any remorse. Il n'a pas manifesté de remords particuliers. Quasiment... It's almost an act of religious repentance to say, I have killed, I did that. It liberates the conscience. He had nothing more to gain, nothing more to do with the world. He was already dead. Forensic psychiatrist Serge Bornstein visited Paulin in custody to prepare a report for the impending trial. He treated us like nuisances, people who had come to bother him in his cell. So he had to be very patient in trying to get a fair bit of information from him. Actually, he didn't show any signs of specific mental problems, but rather long-term psychopathic activity. Paulin's barbarism towards the old ladies he attacked is thought to stem from resentment towards his own grandmother, who had reportedly neglected him. Maybe he was taking revenge for the faults of his family of origin. He probably bore the scars of his childhood, 
manifesting itself in his hostility towards old women. There was most likely some kind of symbolism at play with him trying to get revenge or to erase the cruel elements of his childhood. Du symbolique où il essaie de se venger ou d'effacer des éléments cruels de son enfance. Here we've got an individual who was constantly rejected at several different levels. Rejected by his mother, didn't fit in with his wider family, rejected by his peers at school. And even society, given the inherent racism and the inherent homophobia, it just shows the impact that the combination of these rejections can have on an individual. Jean-Thierry Maturin had also been arrested and charged with the eight murders he committed alongside Paulin in 1984. His defence lawyer, Michel Arnaud, has vivid memories of her one and only encounter with Paulin at a meeting organised at the Palais de Justice by the investigating judge. He wanted to ask questions to Thierry Paulin in the presence of Jean-Thierry Maturin. He wanted to ask Thierry Paulin some questions in the presence of Jean-Thierry Mathurin in an attempt to find the truth. What was the true role of each man? What exactly had Jean-Thierry Mathurin done? Had he gone further than he had said? Because Jean-Thierry Mathurin said, I only did the searching. It was Thierry Paulin who tortured them, who killed them. And then I saw Thierry Paulin for the first time and he actually came in laughing, laughing uproariously, a truly unforgettable laugh. It was completely surreal, inappropriate. And I have to admit that I was stunned. And actually, he didn't answer my questions. He just laughed. And Jean-Thierry Mathurin, I saw him, head down, staring at his shoes, regardant ses chaussures, voulant être ailleurs. Paulin pointed the finger of suspicion directly at his ex-lover. He blamed him for everything. It was Jean-Thierry Mathurin who had done it all. Him, he was in there for nothing. It was the complete opposite of what the case file said. Nothing came of it. There was definitely a time limit on Paolan in terms of the, the criminal justice process because he committed so many murders and, and bringing all of those victims justice would have taken an incredibly long time. You've got an awful lot of evidence there and that process can be many, many years in the making. And here was a man who didn't have many years. Um, his health deteriorated very quickly after he was arrested and he was dead within two years of, of being caught. On April 17th, 1989, Thierry Paulin died in the hospital wing at Fresnes Prison. He was 25 years old. Paulin's death meant that his accomplice, Jean-Thierry Maturin, was left to face the weight of the French justice system alone. Philippe Bilger was prosecuting. It is evident that the society it is clear that French society had been afraid for a long time in the face of the atrocious murders of the old ladies. And as soon as the trial came around, of course, public curiosity descended on the trial, for which only Maturin remained. You have to realize that at the time, we had just abolished the death penalty. And because of that, People were marching in the street, calling for the murderer of these old ladies to be executed. Maturin's trial began in December 1991. Paulin may have been dead, but his presence was felt in the courtroom. Au procès, le fantôme de Paulin était là, partout. Et on m'a demandé de... The ghost of Paulin was present throughout the trial, and they asked me to speak too, and I spoke about Maturin, but I brought up all of the encounters I had had with Paulin. So I described this wicked character and his hatred for humanity, especially old ladies. And that really interested the court. He may no longer have been there, but his ghost hovered over the room. It was unbelievable. I think that even if he had been given the means to do so, Paulin would never have found redemption 
because he had a hard core of criminal perversity within him. de Paulin parce que c'était un noyau dur de perversité criminelle qu'il avait en lui. Il est évident que à l'encontre de Paulin, j'aurais demandé Well, obviously, I would have requested the maximum mandatory prison sentence for Paulin. I wanted Matarin to receive a slight reduction in his mandatory sentence to really indicate the difference between the two and to do as if Paulin was also present, as if he was there too, in a certain way. The main perpetrator of the murders was no longer able to be punished, so the court could only deal with the one offender who was still alive. But many felt that Matarin was far from being just an accomplice. This is crucial, because calling him an accomplice can make you believe that he didn't have a hand in the crimes like Paulin, the mastermind, did. He is the co-instigator, of course, but I have always thought that Matarin probably wouldn't have committed the crimes he was found guilty of had it not been for Paulin. Il n'aurait pas commis les crimes qui lui étaient reprochés. Il y a une différence considérable entre le monstre there is a considerable difference between the monster Paulin and Maturin, his submissive colleague who only followed, manipulated by Paulin, who was far more intelligent than him, who was a very subtle man, but one who put all of that aside in favor of evil. He was two men in one, with one side well adapted to society and the other a monstrous delinquent. Donc de délinquant monstrueux. On the 20th of December 1991, four years after his arrest, Jean Thierry Matarin was given a life sentence for his part in the murders. He was released in January 2009, having spent a total of 21 years in prison. Je suis profondément convaincu. I'm absolutely convinced you should never lose faith in humanity. So, that's my belief. I think even if you have committed terrible, atrocious acts, you can work towards turning over a new leaf with sincere remorse and the desire to redeem yourself. I think it's possible and that our society has to work towards giving such people a chance. Maturin a réussi à gommer. Maturin managed to erase quite a few memories and adapt to a normal social life. It was a very rare therapeutic success because this is someone who has obviously committed crimes, participated in a series of crimes, who has uh, recovered some kind of conscience and from that time on is leading a completely decent life. We are faced here with a remarkable case of redemption. You know, if I had been in charge, I would have kept Matarin in prison forever, without any qualms. This much is clear. You see, I wouldn't have cried if they told me Matarin would live the rest of his life in prison. I am convinced that without Paulin, Matarin wouldn't have done a thing. Although he was never convicted because of his premature death, Paulin is still remembered in France as a terrifying and cold-blooded killer. He really was the worst criminal I have ever seen in the course of my long career. The worst. Le pire. J'oserais vous dire que je pense qu'il avait une négation complète des valeurs humaines. I dare say that I think he was in complete denial of all human values. He saw other people as just animals. He had an animalistic side to him, what we would call dehumanization. How can you kill a granny without thinking about what she stands for and all that kind of thing? He had a savage side to him, devoid of all forms of humanity. I think he was a wicked young man. I think he was deeply troubled. But that is no excuse for the deaths of 
19, 20, 21, 22 elderly women, nor for the brutal manner of many of their deaths. He was a vile being, a real monster, and it seemed like there was some kind of divine justice because he perished in the worst circumstances, and it appeared as if the heavens, in their fury, had wanted to show that he had no place in humankind. Paulin was a greedy hedonist whose lust for fun and popularity drove him to commit at least 18 horrific murders. His death means we will never know the exact amount. With and without Jean Thierry Matarin by his side, he callously targeted vulnerable elderly women and took their lives before he took their money. Thierry Paulin was, without doubt, one of the world's most evil killers.